Hi everyone and welcome to this video which goes through how we measure attitudes as part of the social influence topic for stage 2 psychology. Let's get started. So measuring attitudes relates to the science inquiry skills of psychology. So attitudes can be measured using both objective and subjective data collection strategies. The main research methods include the following. Behaviour counts, self-reports and implicit association tests or IATs. Let's look at these in a little bit more detail. So let's start with behaviour counts. This is classified as an objective quantitative method that's used to measure attitudes. So it's well suited for gathering data about some kind of issue. So for example, it's quite possible to observe students' attitudes towards wearing the school uniform by directly observing and counting the number of students wearing correct and incorrect school uniform. So due to the inconsistencies between attitudes and behaviour, just observing a behaviour is not necessarily an accurate measure of the attitude. So care needs to be taken when evaluating the validity and reliability of using a behaviour count for assessing attitudes. The reliability of behaviour counts can be increased by ensuring there is consistency between the behaviours recorded by the researchers and observers. This is called inter reliability. So in other words, making sure that the same behaviours and the same extent of behaviours are consistent across all researchers. So the researchers agree on what actual behaviours they are targeting or counting. So behaviour counts have their own advantages and disadvantages. Advantages of behaviour counts can include that they're more valid than self-reports. We'll talk about self-reports a little bit later, but often people can give social desirability bias in self-reports, whereas behaviour counts can be objective and they can be verified. So often they increase the validity of the data collected. As a result, they can often be less subjective, which again increases the validity. Having said that, as mentioned before, there are disadvantages of behaviour counts. As we know from my previous video, attitudes and behaviour are not always consistent. So this may be cognitive dissonance and other factors that affect the bidirectional relationship. So even though we may be counting certain behaviours, that doesn't actually mean that the attitude is correct. For example, someone may be putting their hand up and doing all of their work for a particular subject. However, they may dislike the subject, but simply counting the number of times they put their hand up or take notes or arrive to class on time would actually indicate they have a positive attitude towards that subject, which is not always the case. So behaviour counts don't always reflect the correct attitude. It can also be difficult to measure the strength of the attitude in some cases. If I was observing a maths class at a school, it would be difficult just by looking at the students working through the questions and what the teacher is saying to know how much they really love or really hate maths. So just by counting behaviours or observing behaviour can be quite difficult in determining the strength of an attitude in some cases, and that's a disadvantage. The other advantages, relate, uh, disadvantages, I should say, sorry, related to behaviour counts is that often we get numbers, but we don't really find out the subjectivity. Because we are measuring attitudes, we want to find out the reasons why people have these attitudes. And simply collecting behaviour counts or objective quantitative data doesn't really give us that information. So another very, very common way in which we do gather attitudes, probably the most popular, are self-reports. So these comprise of written or spoken answers to questions or statements presented by the researcher. Now, this can be both quantitative, so it can be in the form of rating scales, or they can be qualitative, so in the form of surveys and interviews with written responses. But regardless, it is always subjective, which means subject to bias. So self-report surveys have the advantage of directly questioning participants and allowing them to respond with their own perception of their attitude and the extent to which they agree or disagree. So this is really common with, you know, scales of 1 to 5, 1 to 10, 1 to 7. This is useful for determining how many people are for or against a particular issue and to what extent. Rating scales can also be really, really useful in determining the strength of someone's attitude. So a lot of ones might be a very negative attitude, whereas a lot of fives may be a very positive attitude, depending on, of course, what they're being asked. A limitation of self-reports, however, is that social desirability factors mean responses are not always truthful or accurate, which lowers the validity and reliability. 
Social desirability in self-reports is extremely common, and that means people will give the answers they think the researcher wants to hear or what's the popular social opinion at the time, even though the actual attitude may be the complete opposite of that. So that's one of the main issues of self-reports if we jump to disadvantages, that the validity can be quite low if social desirability is common. In some instances as well, just sticking with disadvantages for a moment, some participants may misunderstand questions or statements. Sometimes when we get surveys uh, regarding a particular attitude, then questions are not worded very well. So we don't really understand what the question is asking or we misunderstand the statement. That can also obviously lead to lowered validity and reliability. There are a lot of advantages of self-reports, however. They're often very simple and quick to administer. So we can get a lot of information, whether it's quantitative, qualitative, or both, very, very quickly in a short amount of time. It is also suited to people who have good verbal skills, so who like to express and explain their attitudes. Another way in which we measure attitudes is the Implicit Association Test, or IAT. So this is a form of test where people will dig, or the aim of the test uh, is to dig deeper than a self-report and bypass some of that social desirability. So attitudes that people express are often in conflict with their actual behaviour. So with implicit measures like the IAT, researchers hope to finally be able to bridge the gap between self-reported attitudes on one hand and the behaviour on the other. So like I said, it bypasses, hopefully, that social desirability. The IAT is typically used to dig deeper than a self-report on issues associated with things like stereotyping, gender roles, racism, sexuality, ageism, and so on. The IAT asks questions that uh, ask you to indicate a preference for one concept over another, usually in a very, very short amount of time, and at the same time, asking whether something is good or bad. For example, you could tell someone whether or not you like maths. Implicit attitudes are positive and negative evaluations that are much less accessible to our conscious awareness. So even if you say you like maths, which is your explicit or exterior attitude, it is possible that you associate math with negativity without actually being actively aware of it. In this case, we would say that your implicit attitude towards maths is negative. However, you're not cognitively aware of this. So that's what the implicit association test or the IAT aims to reveal. However, there are issues with this test as well. Because of the pressure that people are put under to complete this test in a very short amount of time, usually by making very quick and instant decisions, people will often not comprehend the questions and will answer incorrectly or not in a way that's truly reflective of their actual attitude towards the particular topic. So that obviously reduces the validity and the reliability. We also need to be very mindful of the ethical implications of measuring attitudes. This is mainly related to the administration of self-reports to measure attitudes. So these are the main three that we must keep in mind. All of the ethical principles apply here, but these ones in particular. Voluntary participation. Participants have the right to choose to complete them in the first place. Often when we send self-reports, they ask very personal and invasive questions, often on topics that might be seen as quite triggering. So participants have the right to choose to complete them at all. All right, and that goes in line with obviously the ethic of voluntary participation. Confidentiality is also very important. We need to check the participants are happy to divulge certain information and for us to publish their name, or if not, give them an ID number or an alias. Informed consent is also very important. We must obtain consent, uh, the consent form and explain the rights, risks, and the fact that they are able to withdraw from the data collection process. A very common way that this is done is the interview or survey questions are sent to the interviewee or the participants first, so they actually know what it is they're actually answering in regard to the attitude in question. I hope you found this video useful, everyone. As always, any questions, let me know. Otherwise, happy revising.